Hi, everyone. Who, who here has never been to State of the Map before? Me too, actually. This is my first time. So welcome, and also welcome to Minnesota. This is my home state. Um, I was curious, um, so those of you in the audience, does, does anybody work in Africa? A couple of you, just a couple? How about disasters, disastrous management, hazards? Okay, not that many, so this will be a new experience for a lot of you. Um, well, I'm a consultant. I work for the World Bank um, for the Open D uh, Data for Resilience Initiative, or Open DRI team within the bank. Um, and my focus is on urban Africa and geospatial technologies in service to disaster risk management. Um, and Africa is a pretty good place to be right now for disaster risk practitioners uh, because, as many of you may know, Africa's cities are growing. They're, many of them are very dense, and at the same time, they're spreading out um, very rapidly. Uh, populations in African urban areas are expected to double within the next 25 years. And many of the populations uh, that are growing rapidly are those that are sitting in pretty precarious positions within the urban fabric. So you see um, a lot of informal communities living along coasts or along riverbanks, on fragile soils, in places that are very vulnerable to natural hazards. And so considering their already precarious position just uh, environmentally or uh, geographically, they're also s sitting in areas that are not as well serviced by the city in terms of drainage or other uh, flood protection infrastructure. And so you see a lot of these communities facing increasingly more damaging and deadly flooding and landslides and storm surge that's been intensified by sea level rise. And so these city governments um, in these urban areas of Africa need ways of understanding both who and what is at risk in their areas. And the best tools that we have for understanding risk are maps. Stay the map conference. Um, and so our team, OpenDRI, uh, launched this regional initiative in Africa uh, a, a little over a year ago called, uh, excuse me, a little over a year ago called Open Cities Africa. And we've seen a lot of success with the program. And so I wanted to take this opportunity to talk with you about um, some of the aspects of the program that I've found most impactful. And truly, I think some of the, the um, the aspects of, of this program that have, uh, that have really helped sus create sustainable um, action plans for uh, geospatial technology for resilience have been our dedication to open map data and especially the open street map and our collaborations with local people on the ground, universities, experts, um, local governments, and the communities themselves who are impacted. And so I wanted to take a few minutes here to talk with you about some of these aspects. And then I'll just end with a, a very short video that, uh, that includes some of the voices of the people on the ground that have been working so hard in these areas. So um, let me just take a step back and say that the World Bank, um, uh, so Open Cities is an initiative of the World Bank. It provides a service to, uh, to local city governments um, municipalities to respond to a resilience challenge. So World Bank teams will go in and speak with these city agencies and will be asking questions like what hazards are affecting your city and which neighborhoods are you most worried about in these situations. And everything in the subsequent data collection process for Open Cities Africa then feeds back into that resilience challenge specific to the city. Um, and identified by our key stakeholder. So one uh, pretty interesting example that I have here, Saint Louis, Senegal, is one of our cities in the program. Uh, Saint Louis is, you can see it here on the map, the, that top left. Uh, Saint Louis is a city on the West African coast, excuse me, um, and it's got a pretty unique geography. So you see on the eastern side to the right, um, that large area that's, uh, the, that's called SOAR, it's either sometimes called an island, sometimes called part of the mainland, depending on how you conceptualize the rivers around there. And, the, um, and then you've got uh, the, that middle section, that middle island is the heart of San Luis UNESCO World Heritage Site. 
So it's a very important place, um, both historically and uh, infrastructurally for the city. And then you have this sand spit that goes along the western coast of the city and that helps protect the rest of the city from coastal storms. Um, but the sand spit is not just made of sand. It's also been built on by hundreds of families. So you can see some of the OSM infrastructure there. Um, and so you can see that uh, many of these families are fisher families. And they live there because it gives them easy access to the places where they, where they uh, make a living. But living there also means that they're very vulnerable to coastal storms. So a little over a year ago, um, St. Louis was hit by a very large storm. And hundreds of families along that spit were displaced. And the city government um, at first wanted to relocate those uh, displaced families to Cargella, that, uh, that camp that you see in the, uh, in the little box on the, on the Sora inland area. But what the city government didn't have enough information on was the fact that Cariella is actually also in a low-lying area, which means that while it won't get hit by a coastal storm, it could still get inundated. And so the city, St. Louis and other cities, need to be able to collect better data or share with each other better data that, that allows them to respond and mitigate uh, these hazards. So what we do is after we talk with um, uh, city governments, Open Cities goes in and, and hires a technical team to implement the, the Open Cities initiative in each city. And so we operate according to this workflow um, that starts with engaging locals, engaging community stakeholders, governments, uh, and then uh, creating and collecting or organizing data related to this resilience challenge. Then teams go in and uh, develop tools that help these stakeholders respond to that challenge in some way. And then finally, we work to sustain these efforts and make sure that this data continues beyond the lifespan of the original seed funding. Um, so just to reiterate, I guess, um, Within the assessment phase, one of the important things is to identify those key stakeholders who are uh, affected by or working on that resilience challenge and uh, investigating the, the key end users for the ultimate data product, people who will be able to support the city in protecting people from these hazards. The assessment is also when we uh, will go in and, and talk with government agencies as well as universities or other data purveyors and see whether there's any data already that exists that can be used to help us understand these hazards and these and the exposure situation. And this is also when we start to find, you know, that some data sets might exist but have not been shared, are not publicly available, um, are outdated or missing important information. The age old story that we have with, uh, with map data. Then in the mapping phase, you, this is where you see field mappers on the ground and remote mappers you know, on their computers uh, mapping from satellite imagery and with data collection apps. Then in the development phase, we really work to uh, design and test tools that are useful to the end user, not just creating data for the sake of data. And so I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. And finally, in the, sus the sustainability phase, that concluding phase, where, which many of our teams are in right now, um, teams work to make sure that the data that they've collected and the relationships that they've built throughout this program are sustained. Um, and so Open Cities started six or seven years ago in South and Southeast Asia. But this is the first time that we've scaled up the initiative to a cohort of teams. So we've got a dozen cities in Africa all working approximately simultaneously to map their cities. And uh, with that cohort, something that's been really innovative and interesting about this project is that we've been able to provide both online and in-person trainings and workshops and other forms of mentorship for these teams that are collaborating with their stakeholders. So what you see here is a couple screenshots from our online forum. Uh, which we provide to anyone uh, working on these initiatives. So we'll have office hours from uh, our teams themselves, and then as well as uh, webinars from experts in the OSM community, you know, people who can talk to teams about their data collection strategies, their data models, cartography, um, user-centered design. 
And then there's uh, forum pages where, uh, where these uh, teams can actually communicate with each other about what's been working and what hasn't been. Then we also meet in person at regional meetings. Uh, so we've now done two and we're about to do our third regional meeting in Africa where all of these teams get to, together in one place and again meet with these OpenStreetMap experts, people from the community who can talk with them about uh, the most uh, uh, tried and true methods for, for data collection and cleaning and, uh, and cartography. And this November, we're actually going to be at State of the Map in Africa. So if any of you are going to Abidjan, you'll see us there. And so the goal with this initiative really is to help local governments understand and prepare for risk. But it's also to build the capacities of governments and their local networks to use geospatial tools for resilience. And so it's this combination of both data collection and capacity building that I find very valuable in this, in this program and what I wanted to highlight here. So I just wanted to take a moment and uh, look at a few of the different stakeholders that we've been working with and how we engage with them in this work. So oftentimes in our cities, our closest collaborator will be a local university. And in fact, some of our uh, hired technical teams are made up of a consortium where you'll see a regional uh, technical firm partnering with a local university um, for the data collection. And some of our best mappers come from that, uh, tapping into that network from the university. So you'll get students from you know, the local geomatics department, or you'll get the local OSM chapter involved or youth mappers. And uh, one city that's really done an amazing job of this is Zanzibar, um, which is, if we go back, I didn't have that many maps in this presentation, so I have to keep depending on the one. <laughs> Uh, Zanzibar is just to the east of, uh, it's a semi-autonomous region of Tanzania, so it's that island that's uh, off the eastern coast of Tanzania. And so the State University of Zanzibar has been working with the Zanzibar Commission of Lands to map all of the buildings on the largest island of Zanzibar called Ungunja, and um, collecting drone imagery for the entire archipelago of Zanzibar. And uh, so the Open City Zanzibar team, uh, in collaboration with SUSA, has, been, has conducted now 25 trainings over the course of two years for students and other mappers. And they're working now to establish a Zanzibar City Innovation Lab, which is just an amazing thing to hear from a sustainability perspective. Um, another benefit that we see in working with universities on, this, uh, on, on these resilience challenges is that we often find th that the OpenStreetMap data that's collected is much better when we collaborate with these uh, local um, technical experts on the ground. Local mappers, whether they're students or community members or professors, often have a better understanding of the local area. And they're able to better interpret satellite imagery of their home area as well. And then the partnership with these local OSM chapters um, and institutions provides a check on what would other be, otherwise be mismanaged data. You know, sometimes technical firms don't have OSM experience or they're not used to working in an open environment. And so having uh, multiple teams or multiple actors on the same team allows us to put a, uh, keep a check on poorly designed data models or uh, improperly tagged um, features. And then, of course, local government. I mean, coming from the World Bank, it's just a no-brainer that we work with local government because that's what we do is we serve local and, and federal uh, agencies. But you still see a lot of World Bank uh, projects hiring, let's say, a regional technical firm who goes into a city, disappears for eight months, and comes back with some final product. And so with Open Cities Africa, we're not doing that. Um, we, we actually consult and engage local government throughout the entire process, through all phases of it. And so one of the crucial stages uh, within, in, in gaining that, that uh, government support is in that first assessment phase, because that's our first chance to uh, meet with these governments and talk with them about opening up their data. Um, 
And so you see, for example, like a water and sanitation agency or department within uh, the municipality sharing their drainage data publicly for the first time, or the communal development agency in the, in the example of San Luis shares decades old street view images, um, not street view in the way that we, that we think of it now, but uh, photos from the street that would otherwise have just gone you know, unnoticed gathering dust. Another um, really cool thing about being about this direct involvement with governments is that we uh, they get to be trained in on open mapping, and so uh, I talked a little bit about those both online and in person meetings. Our government stakeholders are actually involved in all of that, so they participate in those online forums. They attend these regional meetings, and so they're going to state of the map. They're going to phosphor G and understanding risk conferences, and so you see like the local coordinator of. Uh, the development program in Pointe Noire, Congo, asking hot questions about you know, data integration. Or you see the director of a municipal agency giving feedback on the, the data tool prototypes that the technical team has been designing for them. And you definitely see the effect, you know, the positive effect of, of that inclusion. Uh, Seychelles is a great example. Up in the top right, you can see what looks like pipe cleaners. They are indeed pipe cleaners. Uh, the Seychelles team was designing a prototype of a possible data tool that could be used by stakeholders for the data that they had collected on their, on their islands. And it was a really cool tool. It was for firefighters. And it was uh, meant to provide routing information, the location of fire hydrants, um, exposure information, or even up-to-date weather. But ultimately, it was thanks to the user-centered design um, uh, workshops that the Seychelles team decided to scrap that idea. Unfortunately, but fortunately, because it was through consultation with these stakeholders that they understood that this would only really benefit a single department, whereas a more standard geo database that automatically extracts OSM, uh, OSM data um, would actually be able to serve multiple agencies at once. So it serves not only the fire department, but tourism and urban planning. Oh, and so one other really nice thing about having governments in the room with you when you're working throughout this process is that they get to see some really cool tools and they get really excited about them. So at our last regional meeting, uh, there were quite a few uh, drone sessions including interactive drone sessions. And we saw you know, twice as many governments suddenly wanted to get uh, drone imagery capture in their cities uh, because they had actually talked with these experts about how it works and how it can be used. Um, and then last but not least, of course, are the local communities. Uh, and I think the assessment phase, again, at that very beginning is really where uh, we found the most, the strongest relationship with communities and, and the, the biggest benefits of, uh, of this approach. Uh, the assessment phase is when we had teams do, for example, a gender analysis of the communities affected by these hazards. So they asked questions of, you know, how are women and men differentially affected by a hazard? You know, for example, in some cities, different times of day, men and women tend to be in different places of the city. So how does that affect their ability to get to a safe, safe place when there's a flash flood? Um, and it helped us to better understand the resilience challenge because of course we're hearing from the people who are impacted directly. And so I really wanna give a shout out to the uh, Ngaundere team in Cameroon for their work in this. And of course I have to go back to the map all the way to show you where Cameroon is. Where'd it go? Okay. <laughs> it's, oh, I can't reach it. Okay, it's in the middle, the very middle one. Hopefully you can read this map. You're probably all cartographers, right? So the Ngaundere team was uh, really just uh, so thorough in, in their focus groups um, that they conducted during this assessment phase and moving into the, the mapping phase with different members of the community. You know, they'd have women-only groups and men-only groups and civil society groups um, across the board. And uh, that was actually how um, 
they when they when they did these focus groups, they brought in paper maps of the data that was that already existed in OpenStreetMap and from government agencies, and that's where people were able to give that first pass, pointing out of um, the drainage networks that uh, that were missing or damaged buildings that that had already been hit by a landslide or a mudslide, the the extensive flooding, and then Monrovia too in Liberia, back to the map. It's on the west coast, or in Western Africa. Um, it's that uh, the one below Senegal, right on that bottom uh, southwest corner of uh, Western Africa. So Monrovia uh, has a really active civil society, uh, um, but they don't always feel like their voices are heard. And so I really was impressed by both our technical team that we hired, as well as the broader World Bank project in prioritizing meeting all these different groups. And uh, so it was through these meetings with like the Slum Dwellers Association, for example, that uh, the, the Monrovia team decided to print and distribute paper atlases of their data in addition to the, the data tool that they, that they had designed for, for digital work with, among GIS experts within, the, within government agencies. And then community mappers are also, they weren't just participating in that assessment phase, but they're also active mappers um, in, during, during the data collection. And so in the future, we're, we're actually planning to really try to formalize that relationship with the community and the mapping process. So we're going to be designing uh, certificates, excuse me, certificated programs um, that, uh, that, for example, local youth can, can um, enroll in, even if they're not part of the university. And we're providing cash for work options, you know, whether it's stipends or, or other options for people who've dedicated their time to mapping. So that was, those are the big three. And of course, we also have you know, experts from the OpenStreetMap community like yourselves participating in the form of contributing to our training materials or providing those webinars or, or sessions at conferences like this. Um, so I just wanted to conclude that resilience is only really sustainably impactful when you're engaging all key players within the process um, and within the space that you're working. And we're really happy with the results that we've been seeing. And I just wanted to end once more on hearing from those partners that I've been referring to throughout this presentation with a very short video. And it sounds like, I think I'm on pretty good time, so we'll have, it's just a four minute video, and then if we have any questions, we can talk afterwards or, you know, between sessions. So let's see if this works. If this session doesn't have a single technical difficulty, I'm going to... Africa is home to some of the world's fastest growing cities. As populations grow, more people are moving into exposed and poorly connected areas. Governments and community leaders are faced with the challenge of protecting urban residents from floods, landslides and other hazards. Avant, these two rivers that you see had a very big section qui pouvait contenir les eaux sans problème. Mais de nos jours, avec l'augmentation de la population et aussi la situation des déchets au niveau des collecteurs, ces deux rivières sont saturées de déchets. Quand il pleut, on est aux aguets. Il faut être prudent. Il faut veiller. Même s'il si pleut à 3 heures, il ne faut pas dormir. En faisant entre l'eau et le sable. Bon, donc euh, ce qui a fait qu'on est c'est parce que pendant trois semaines, ça en fait plus. Par exemple, il y a des land conflicts you know people are not aware of the features of their existing area so when we have this open map system i think we will reduce these problems facing our office knowing who and what is at risk starts with a map through open cities africa governments and their communities are building the maps they need to protect their city from hazards Open Cities teams adapt innovative new technologies and local fieldwork to gather information about an area. At the desk, students and other mappers use drone and satellite imagery to trace buildings and visible features. On the ground, field mappers work with local residents to bring their own knowledge to the map, adding thousands of streets, markets, rivers, canals and more into OpenStreetMap. This map data is being used to plan better, build better and respond better to disaster. 
avec les données que nous avions aujourd'hui et la connaissance sur la cartographie, ça nous permettrait euh, une fois, avec euh, les projets de, les, des espaces verts, de contrôler les différents arbres que nous allons avoir, le planting. We've had disaster issues around the country. We have been uh, used to going on the field using satellite imagery to collect those data. But with this instrument, uh, we're going to add more value to the kind of work we do. And I think it's going to be pretty good work. It's going to help us in collecting our disaster information and disaster breaks data. On ne peut plus rien faire sans la maîtrise de l'information, sans la maîtrise de la donnée. Et nous avons tant de ressources, tant de potentialités à traduire en données. Donc le monde de demain, c'est vraiment l'information, c'est vraiment la donnée. We have the same geography and more or less the same capacity. It has encouraged us to see that there is a lot in common that can be shared and can be built on, and there is a lot of information that we can share and do better and take the agenda for disaster preparedness and management, a prevention and reduction forward. It's a project à la fois local in a pays, in a ville. Mais il s'agit aussi d'un projet pratiquement continental. C'est une dizaine de villes africaines. The impact is felt at the end of the day because they were involved from day one. Et j'ai vu que les problèmes sont presque les mêmes en Afrique. Ils sont récurrents et c'est la même chose. Nous avons les mêmes problèmes, c'est cela. And there you have it. Thank you.